name of Jesus Christ for those who are present here and those who are joining us via their Facebook page. We welcome you and we pray that the Lord will speak to us once again as we turn to his word. Let's pray. Father, we thank you, Lord Jesus Christ, once again for this opportunity we could gather, Lord, around your word, Lord, through different mediums, Lord. We're gathering here, Lord, to hear you speak to us, Lord. Come and help us, Lord, how to trust you even in this situation. Come and help us, Lord, how we can depend fully on you, Lord Jesus Christ, in the midst, Father, of, in, of this situation. Lord, we give you glory. We give you honor. We give you praise, O oh Lord, for we draw our hope from you, for our ultimate hope comes from you, Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you for the example and the model you've set for us, Lord, how we can trust the Father even in the midst of our troubles. Lord, we thank you. Be exalted, Lord, once again. This day, Lord Jesus Christ, take your rightful place in our midst, in our lives, Lord. Come, Lord, and, and once again, Lord, be in our thoughts, in our hearts, in our actions, Lord. In every way, you be glorified in the wonderful and precious name of Jesus Christ. In the house, said, amen. Amen. We thank the Lord for his word. You may be seated. We thank the Lord that, Lord, we could find courage in his word. In life, we all face some form of trouble. 
we all have to deal with some form of trouble once or so in a while especially now with the emergence of the COVID-19 pandemic our trouble seems to have become so stuck and intrusive our trouble seems to be just overtaking every set of circumstances it is in situations like these where many cry out God where are you so the psalm is fully aware of situations like this will draw us to an example that exp that actually represents a life that trusted God in the midst of trouble. He admonishes us to trust God amid our troubles. We must learn that to continue to trust God in the midst of our troubles. As trusting God is the best antidote to dealing with any form of trouble or affliction one may face even in the midst of these afflictions and anguish the psalmist will draw us to a place of saying even right there you can trust god the psalmist in psalm 22 prophetically reflects on the experience of jesus crucifixion and he sees it as, as the representation of the most intense or severe trouble any human being can face with the emergence of COVID-19, many people are experiencing severe trials. Many are experiencing severe pain, whether it's through death, whether it's through loss, loss of a job, loss of a loved one, and so forth. However, it is best that we can join along with the psalmist to say that we can trust God in the midst of our troubles. If you want a title for this sermon, I've entitled this sermon, Trust God in the Midst of of your troubles <laughs> trust God in the midst of your trouble but then he teaches us he helps us to know how do we trust God in the midst of our troubles and if you may turn with me to Psalm 22 and we're going to work through Psalm 22 particularly from verse 1 to verse 21 and allude to the rest of the psalm but I want to start first reading verse 1 to verse 5 and then we'll continue to reflect on the rest of the psalm as we go along so our, our foundational text reads, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from saving me? So far from my cries of anguish. My God, I cry out by day, but you do not answer. By night, but I do not find rest. Many people usually stop there. But the psalmist continues in verse 3 and says, Yet you are enthroned as the Holy One. You are the one Israel praises. In you, our ancestors, the other translation says, Our fathers, in you, our, our fathers put their trust. They trusted and you delivered them. To you they cried out and were saved. In you they trusted and were not put to shame i want you to hear him he says in verse 4 he says in you our fathers put their trust in you not in the political system not in the economic system not in the social system but he says in you oh yahweh our fathers put their trust they trusted and you delivered them for to you they cried out and they were saved in you they trusted and were not put to shame it is as we read this account it is this account that teach us about the providence of god that it is even in the providence of god that we can see the purposes of god fulfilled that there is no situation that surprises god but in every situation god has already has already made providence for that very situation it does not it, it does not matter how severe the circumstances may seem but god has made a way he makes a way where there seems to be no way. And so the psalmist therefore will draw us to the example of the crucifixion. And then in these examples, picking up the model of Christ and said, the model of Christ is meant to teach us how we can trust God in the midst of our troubles. The book of Psalms, as we all are aware, it, 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 it's made of 150 poems or praise songs, which could be categorized under two themes. And the first theme be psalms of lament and the other theme could be psalms of praise or psalms of hope poems of lament are characterized by prayers 
of pain, prayers of confusion, of anger. And these prayers draw attention to what's wrong in the world. And so they ask God to do something about it. These prayers of lament predominate the first three books of the Psalter, so, which is, will be Psalm 1 to Psalm 89. Whereas on the other hand, we find the, 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 the Psalms of praise, of hope. And these Psalms of praise are, are, are Psalms of, of, of joy, of celebration, and they draw attention to what is good in the world and retell the story of what God has done in the world. And therefore, we are meant to therefore respond with praise and thanksgiving because of what he has done. However, in some of these uh, poems or, or Psalms, both these themes of lament and hope are interwoven within an individual psalm, especially in Psalm 22, where we see that in the midst of the lament, God still expresses a, 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 a sense of hope in the midst of, of despair that we can find hope in God. Perhaps this is to teach us that we can learn to praise God, to thank God even in the midst of the lament. What is a lament? A lament could be defined as a passionate expression of grief or sorrow. It is an action which expresses sadness, regret, and disappointment. And in this, that this is to teach us that every life will have an experience of pain or lament. But he draws on, the psalmist draws on the example of Jesus as the one who knows what it means to lament. As somebody once said that to lament is to taste the tears of God. The Psalm 22 could be seen as containing these three scenes of lament and praise. Certainly the gospel writers could not read it without thinking of the cross of Christ. We notice that the first verse of the psalm was quoted by the Lord Jesus Christ. For some of us, preferably known as the third word of Jesus on the cross. It is interesting actually to notice that Mark's translation kept the original Aramaic expression of Eloi, Eloi. We know that prayer when he says Eloi, Eloi, Lama Sabatan. But however, Matthew translated the original expression into Hebrew, which says Eli, Eli, Lama Sabatan. What does it mean? He calls on upon the Lord himself. He cries out to the Lord. And the first, the first question is, who do you cry out to in the midst of your lament? This psalm not only tells us of Jesus' cry on the cross, but it also describes the manner of his death, the severe pain. Mentioned detail after detail. The crucifixion seems to be prophesied, therefore, in this psalm. And the psalm is comprised on the other end of two parts. Verse 1 to verse 21 is the first part of the psalm, which is a, pray, is a psalm of lament, whereas the psalmist cries out unto the God seeking his help. I want to mention here that this psalm is not necessarily speaking of David because David never had such a subjective experience himself. Because some of the psalms will, will perhaps speak of maybe illness or danger or betrayal or something. But however, this psalm speaks uh, prophetically of the crucifixion. Remember then, crucifixion was not practiced in the time of David, even long for centuries after that. But however, this psalm will prophetically speak of the life of Jesus who was going to go through severe affliction and trial. But in the midst of that affliction, he learned to trust God. So this psalm is an account of a prophetic picture of the suffering that was going to be endured by Jesus when he died the penalty, to pay the penalty of our sins. Therefore, the psalm is prophetic and therefore it's entirely messianic. But not only that, this psalm is also the best model of how we can learn to trust God in the midst of our trials, in the midst of our troubles. Hence, on the other hand, the second psalm, therefore, the second part of the psalm, which is verse 22 to 31, is a song of praise. The psalmist is praising God for his faithfulness. He's praising God for sustaining him even in the midst of his troubles. For he delivered him from all his afflictions. However, in both sections, the psalmist expresses both the lament of praise and affliction with conflicting emotions. 
It is in the first part where we see despair alternating with hope. As he expresses his trust in God in the affliction. In the second part, his immediate personal joy gives way to the distant and, un and the universal form of worship to God for the good that which he has done. Let's come back to the beginning. Now, the lament that dominates the first part is found in verses 1 to 2, in verses 6 to 8, in verses 12 to 18. However, each lament is countered by an expression of trust. As he recorded in verse 3 to verse 5, verse 9 to 11, verse 19 to 21, with a call to the whole world to respond to worship God in prayer. That even in the midst of your trouble, you can turn to God and worship him. This description of the sufferer here does not seem to characterize the response of most of our lives as Christians. So many times when we are facing afflictions or trouble, we don't usually express our trust in God in the midst of the situation. But as Jesus, Jesus on the other hand, even as he was facing severe affliction, he turned to God. Because that is the best antidote to deal with any form of trouble is trusting God. The psalmist prophetically is teaching us how Jesus trusted God even in the worst affliction of his life. The psalmist therefore would say of Jesus and expresses this lament in this way. His first lament is a cry to God. And he cries to God and says, God, why have you forsaken me? His second lament is a cry against the people that he lives with. That Lord, he not only feels away from God, but even the people that he lives with are the very ones who are attacking him. Because they, they, they would mock him and insult him even in his weakest moments. The third lament, he is lamenting for himself. For he feels he is suffering more than any other human being. Or perhaps he is questioning if should any human being suffer so much trouble. When we are in difficult times, most of us will cry, why me? I don't know if you've been there, where you go through a situation, say, God, why me? Why do I have to go through this? When you say, God, I don't think I deserve this. And this question seems to be more personal when you've, you feel like you've served God for most of your life and you've tried your best to be faithful. And yet, in the midst of that, you still have to face affliction. You're wondering why your family is going through what is going through. When in your mind, your family has served God so faithful for so many years, why is he allowing that to happen to your family? Is this the same feeling that we are hearing here in verse 1 when the psalmist will cry out, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? This experience seems so intense that it does not only affect his physical body, but it seems to be affecting both also the emotions and the spirit. In a moment of difficulty when he needs the presence of God to sustain him, he feels like God has abandoned him. When it happens to us, when we feel like God is not there, when we think that in the moment of difficulty, we feel that God has left us. At that moment, when we need God's deliverance in a moment, a moment of difficulty, it feels like he is not there. And sometimes this can be made worse by those around us who will misinterpret the situation and say, but God is not here. But we see this is made worse by those around Jesus. Even at the cross, Jesus suffering was intensified by those who mocked him at the cross. That is why when we read Psalm 22 verse 6 to 8, he would say, but I am a worm and not a man, scorned by men and despised by the people. All who see me mock me. They hell insults, shaking their heads. He trusts in the Lord. Let the Lord rescue him. Let him deliver him since he delights in him, since he trusts in him. We could hear these words in the words of the people who were around Jesus on the cross, as Matthew 27, 39, 44 will tell us, when they will say to Jesus, those who pass by held insults at him, shaking their heads and saying, you who are going to destroy the temple and build it in three days, save yourself. 
come down from the cross if you are truly the son of God. In the same way, the chief priests, the teachers of the law, and the elders, they mocked him. He saved others, they said, but he can't save himself. He's the king of Israel. Let him come down from the cross and we will believe in him. But there's something right that they said. They said he trusts in God. They said, let God rescue him now if he wants him. For he said, I am the son of God. In the same way, the robbers who were crucified with him also heaped insults on him. But there's something that we can see here between the psalmist and Matthew's connection here. Is that there's God's providence. That God already knew about the situation, but he's already made providence to fulfill his own purposes. That it does not matter what happens. God will still move history towards his own destiny. It does not matter what you have to go through. I can tell you that Jesus will have the last word in your life if you trust him. That is why the psalmist therefore will say in verse 3, yet you are enthroned as the holy one. You are the one that Israel praises. That no situation will remove him from his throne. But let's come back to these mockers. Let's come back to these people around. These people who were mocking Jesus in the midst of his affliction. It seems strange that the very people on whom he should be able to rely on are part of his very problem. The very people he was going to lay down his life for are the very people who are causing these affliction. It's like when you help people and you give them your best. But the very people you have helped turn against you. Suddenly they have forgotten all the good things that you have helped them with. Yet, when we believe in God's providence, when we trust in God, we still are able to forgive and we still be able to fulfill God's purposes and proclaim his righteousness. The psalmist, in, in, in his third expression of lament, he returns to describe his affliction and how it feels like in verses 12 to verse 18. He pictures his tormentors as hidden behind the animal masks they were. Using metaphors from the animal kingdom, the psalmist will write in verse 12, Many bulls surround me, strong bulls of Basham encircle me. In verse 13, say, roaring lions tearing their, their prey, open their mouths wide against me. Verse 16 says, dogs have surrounded me. All these verses and others in between describe the painful death that Christ suffered, but it expresses the severe affliction that one can experience but i've learned that this psalm is trying to teach us that no suffering or pain can be, be beyond this one and if god can see jesus through this pain and suffering so he will see us through any other suffering when we trust him because we learn that jesus even in this situation he trusted in god Jesus, as the psalmist tells us, does not give up or throw in the towel against the forces of evil. But he continues trusting God that God will bring him through, that God will give him victory eventually. This is a great lesson for us to learn as believers. That we need to trust God and remain in his will even if we don't see what is happening. Or even if we don't know the outcome of the situation. We need to trust that God, number one, that God is sovereign. <laughs> And in his sovereignty, we can see him outworking his purpose. But number two, we also learn that his will is good and his will will prevail. We got to be patient and stick with God in the midst of any situation. Hence, the psalmist will go on to tell us why we need to do this. is because God is holy. He's enthroned on high as a holy God. And being holy, it means that he's consistent. He's a God who never changes. He is a faithful God. And because he's a faithful God, it means he will do what he promised that he will do. The Bible is full of the promises that God gives his children so that they can rely on his promises. The psalmist then affirms, therefore, not only that who he is, but his power. Hear what he says in verse 4 to verse 5. He says, in you our fathers put their trust. They trusted and you delivered them. They cried out to you and you saved them. In you they trusted and they were not disappointed. Because he's a God who is faithful and he is true. He looks the psalmist here looks at the great 
a historical event of the Exodus where God revealed his power in delivering the Israelites from Egypt. And in looking at this experience, he says he is the same God even today, that Jesus is still the same yesterday, today, and forever. So our Yahweh doesn't change. And if he could deliver them yesterday, he will deliver them even today. He says those who trust in him, they will be delivered. He says, they cried out to you and were saved. In you, they trusted and they were not disappointed. This is another great lesson. That when we go through different trials, we must remember what God has done before. We must remember what God has taken us through before. If we knew that he's taken us through so many other things, why don't we believe that He is the same Yahweh who can do the same even today? Because in every situation, there's a testimony. There's a testimony that will come even amidst, you know, the great afflictions, great testimonies will come. That is why, therefore, the writer of Revelation, in Revelation 12, verse 11, says that the believers overcame by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. Hence, we must continually declare what God has done and praise Him for, for He's powerful and He remains powerful. Then he affirms God's purpose. Here, what he says in verse 9. You, you brought me out of the womb. You made me trust in you. <laughs> and this is to teach us that the death of Christ was not accidental. It was purposeful. That God in his providence, that he knows what's going to happen. And so he makes already providence to help us through those situations. That he can give us strength to sustain us in those very situations. And this is therefore to affirm God's providence. Lastly, the psalmist affirms God's promise in verse 19 to verse 21. Hear what he says. says but you, O Lord, be not far off. O my strength, come quickly to help me. Deliver my life from the sword. My precious life from the power of the dogs. Rescue me from the mouth of the lions. Save me from the horns of the wild oxen. And we see that that's what Jesus did. He put his trust in God. He put God at the center of the situation. And hence his situation was transformed. And so that is a challenge for us. In the midst of the situation that we are facing, both as individuals or corporately, can we put God at the center of it? Because it's only when we put God at the center of it that everything else will transform. That our perspective will change. That we will remember that he is the God who is enthroned, who is the Holy One of Israel. And it is on that testimony that we can respond in praise. That antidote of trusting God in the midst of trouble expresses itself in praise. Because we can have peace and hope in the midst of the situation. Hear what verse 22, something to verse 22 says. It says, I will declare your name to my brothers. In the congregation, I will praise you. We have established that the psalmist is speaking on behalf of Jesus. So the brothers here would be those who believed him, will be those who are his disciples. And so as his disciples, we can join Jesus in the congregation and praise the Lord. Here, the last part of Psalm 22, verse 2, it says that in the congregation, I will praise him. That is why the psalmist from that verse onwards, he speaks of the Lord Jesus himself. We praise him because what? Because he's a great God and he starts to reveal what kind of greatness of this is. In verse 26, he says, those who seek the Lord will praise him. Verse 27 says, all the ends of the earth will remember and turn to the Lord. Verse 28 says, for dominion belongs to the Lord and he rules over the nations. The Lord rules over the nations. He rules over the world. And so as God's people, that is where our hope is. Is in the God who rules all nations. He's not changed by any circumstances. COVID-19 will come and go. The Lord Jesus Christ will remain the same. That's why the psalmist says, for he is enthroned on high. Because he's a holy God. None is like him. Verse 27 says, all the ends of the earth will remember and turn to the Lord. And all the families of the nations will bow down before him. For dominion belongs to the Lord and he rules over all the nations. Let me conclude. So what are we sent to do? There's something he says here as well. Here, he says, 
in verse 30 to 31, he says, future generations will be told about the Lord. They will proclaim his righteousness to a people yet unborn, for he has done it. <laughs> Any situation will come and go. Every dominion will come and go, but he has dominion on every other power. Even above COVID-19, Jesus is still Lord. He still reigns. Yahweh has never changed. He still remains Yahweh. And so because he says this righteousness will be proclaimed to be a people even yet unborn, it is our responsibility that we continue preaching the righteousness of God. We are sent to preach the gospel, to convert sinners, to build up their saints, to plant churches, to administer ordinances as we remember the Lord Jesus Christ. The pattern of our mission is the mission of Christ in the Father. And that will not change with any generation in any circumstances. We are called to do his will, to preach his gospel, to work miracles, and to obtain eternal redemption for his people. Let me close by saying we are called to continue to do the same. As the psalmist encourages us, the psalmist encourages us, says, let us continue proclaiming his righteousness because Jesus has never changed. Jesus is still the same yesterday, today, and forever. He still remains enthroned on high. The challenge is, are we trusting God even in the midst of the troubles that we are facing today? Even amid the troubles of COVID-19, saints, we can trust God. We can trust Jesus to see us through. And the psalmist says, God has given us a model. And the model is Jesus. We know that Jesus himself, the psalmist has told us the sufferings that he had to go through. Yet in the midst of that, those he trusted God. Do you trust God? I don't think any of us has experienced any suffering beyond that of Jesus. But he trusted God. How about we? <laughs> Can you trust God even in this situation? This psalm teaches us that we must not despair. When things are difficult, we must trust God. When we face anguish, we must trust God. Even in those moments when it seems that he is far away, we must cry to him. And he will answer us. Will you trust God today? Do you believe that God will give you a triumph and victory in your troubles? Saints, I believe that God is nearer than sometimes we realize. And he's promised to be our refuge and ever-present help in every time of need. Even in the midst of your trouble, you can trust him. And how do we trust him? The psalmist says, by giving him praise. <laughs> by proclaiming his name and witnessing. And praise him. And praise him. And praise him. That's like having hope in him. Having peace in the midst of this situation. We can trust God in the midst of our troubles because he is the refuge. Psalm 46 says, for God is our refuge and ever-present help in every time of need. I don't know what suffering you're experiencing today. I don't know what trouble that you have to go through today, but I can say to you, you can trust God in the midst of your troubles. Let's pray. Lord, we need you to help us, Lord. Give us the grace and the strength, Lord, to trust you in the midst of of this situation, Lord Jesus Christ. Lord, we thank you that, Lord, we can depend on your word. Lord, we thank you for the model of Jesus, oh Lord, who trusted you even in the midst of anguish, oh Lord. Lord, here we are, Lord Jesus Christ, that, that even those around us may mock us, yet, Lord, we're going to trust in you, Lord. For, Lord, you said those who trusted in you will not be disappointed, oh Lord. Lord, I want to bring every situation presented here today, Lord Jesus Christ. I ask that you will meet the saints Lord, according to your riches and glory. Lord, where they are, Lord Jesus Christ, we pray for those who are sick. Lord, we pray for healing upon their lives, Lord Jesus Christ. For, Lord, it's still the portion, Lord, that we find in the promises for the believers, oh Lord, that they can call upon you, Lord, and find salvation, Lord. We thank you, oh Lord. We pray that, Lord, continue to have your way, even in the midst of COVID-19. Continue to be exalted, Lord Jesus Christ, for you're the God of all the nations, oh Lord. Come and have your way in our midst, Lord, and come and be glorified in the wonderful and precious name of Jesus Christ.